This program is brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. We have as our special guest today, Dr. E. W. Mueller of the National Lutheran Council, Professor George Donahue of the University of Minnesota, Vince Rossiter, President of the Bank of Hartington in Hartington, Nebraska, and Arnold Paulson, Chairman of the Committee for Rural Economic Survival from Granite Falls, Minnesota. Good afternoon. I'm uh, E. W. Mueller, as has been announced, and my particular assignment with the National Lutheran Council I'd like to refer to as the rural sector. By the rural sector, I mean uh, the uh, rural areas, but more than just the small towns, I would like to include all the cities of 10,000 and less in the non-metropolitan counties. When you add all these together, this gives us a total of about 70 million people. And those of us in this panel this afternoon are concerned as to the future of this particular sector of our society. And uh, there are many conferences being held and discussions are taking place and different views are being presented. And many of these views are conflicting views. For instance, uh, some say, just let the thing go and the, the problem will go away. Others take the view that the only solution to the farm problem or the economic problems that we have in this rural sector can be solved by the government programs. And then others say that the farmer himself or rural people themselves need to take a uh, uh, take the initiative and uh, solve their own problems. Now, I'd like to turn to Vince and ask him uh, whether, according to his observation as a banker in Nebraska, whether he thinks that in time that the problem will go away. No, Dr. Mueller, I certainly don't think the problem will go away. I think this problem will live with us as long as we ignore it, and perhaps a good deal longer. I'm satisfied that unless the uh, people of rural America, the farmer and the rural businessmen, and uh, the government uh, engage in a, a, some kind of a, an overall program that they can work in uh, comfortably together, that this problem is going to remain with us for a long, long time, or at least as long as the people last, uh, however long they last. Well, in view of the attitude that we do find in rural areas, among this, uh, people in this rural sector, uh, do you think that they have the capacity or the willingness or the desire to work across uh, interest groups, uh, the farmer working with a businessman, and the businessman working with professional people, and uh, somehow coming up with a joint program. You, uh, as a sociologist, uh, President Donahue, uh, did you have any observation at this point? I would think that willingness to uh, consider the problem is a first step um, to some type of social action directed to the resolution of the problem. But I think even more than that, awareness of the problem. That's where I think there's a lot of uh, work to be done. We assume that people are aware of problems when they actually are not. The problems have never been made known to them, really. Uh, they're very much <coughs> concerned with their individual activities, and they sometimes fail to see the forest as they look at each individual tree. And quite often we blame people for not taking action when they really have no basis for taking action. And I think really an educational program on the part of people who are engaged in education with the farm people, that would include bankers such as yourself, Vince, it would include ministers such as you, E.W., and certainly businessmen such as Arnold Paulson, uh, to become involved in the developing of knowledge on the problem so that people will be able to make intelligent decisions about which way they must act. Is it possible for us to say whether the problem is primarily economic or primarily social? Would you have any uh, judgment at that point? Well, I think whether it's primarily social or economic depends in part upon each individual's perspective. Some people will see it as an economic problem, others as a social problem. But let's back up. You often hear this problem cited, and I'm sure you've heard this, Vince, correct me if I'm wrong, as being a dual problem. One of the problems, uh, one of the definitions is that it's, it's a commercial farm problem of the upper income farm groups. That is an income problem and an economic problem. But the problem of the lower income farm groups is really a problem uh, considered a welfare problem. Or some people even call it a relief problem. 
Then the other point of view is that these power problems are part of the rural community problem as a whole, and that one cannot be dealt su with successfully unless they're both dealt with. Uh, so I would say that it has social implications, it has political implications, it has economic implications, and I'm sure it has religious implications. Well, I'd like to suggest, George, that, uh, that many of the social problems, though, are the outgrowth of the underlying economic problem. Isn't this true? That is, uh, we would have fewer social problems if we had a, a more affluent society in rural America, shall we say? If we had, for example, a general expansion of uh, income and profit in the agricult uh, agricultural economy, wouldn't this solve some of the social aspects of the overall problem? I think it would solve some of the social aspects of the overall problem, but not all of them. In other words, uh, take one of the problems that's a sociological problem, is the organization of educational institutions in rural areas. There are many rural areas where the organization of education uh, is not on an integrated level. There are still areas in which the one-room school system is very apparent. This school system, by most objective criteria, is not competitive with a consolidated school system offering a wider range of courses, and not only that, offering more competitive salaries to teachers to teach in those schools. So while I think upper, uh, increases in incomes in rural areas might help to alleviate this problem, it might not help to uh, develop a problem of reorganization of rural areas which would lead to the resolution of some of these social problems. It's supposed to pull in the long-term problem. Is it might well do that. that. It is at this very point where people in the smaller communities really have some problems. In other words, they have some basic adjustments to make. They have made the adjustment, at least from my observation, in the area of making a living. They've gone from horse agriculture to tractor agriculture and to a very highly uh, efficient agriculture, which has changed our agricultural pattern. But when it comes to making the adjustments in the area of, uh, like you mentioned, the school, or social institutions. We have a particular problem in the area of the church. For instance, our churches were established in rural America at a time when people either drove to church or walked to church. Now, they have made the adjustments in the area of making a living. But now when it comes to the area of making the similar adjustments in the area of uh, merging churches or merging schools or consolidating, at this point we get resistance. Because I think here sort of self-interest seems to conflict or uh, with their, with their uh, group interest? You know, I, I don't want to take all your time, Arnold, <laughs> on this program, but I, I'd like to talk to that point, because you, uh, the point you make is that they have made economic adjustments or technological adjustments, but they haven't made the adjustments in social innovations and institutions is well taken, but it could be uh, sort of uh, an era of omission rather than era of commission. Uh, by that I mean, Actually, um, I don't think they have made the adjustment to making a living. Certain elements of the rural economy have made this adjustment. They've become more efficient, and some of them have gained a return uh, greater than that which they've had before. But I would also maintain that there's a large segment of the rural community through the very, ver uh, through the very process of technological adjustment are making less today than they made in the past. For instance, Minnesota has 38 of its 87 counties where the median farm income is under $3,000. Now, I think these people have not made the adjustment. While the technology of farming has uh, been adjusted by many of the farmers, they are sort of a residual category in the face of this ongoing technological process. And they remain there as somewhat as, uh, you might say, the remains carrying forth the burdens of this adjustment. But those that have made the adjustments, and I would say these are probably the more progressive farmers, they are the ones, however, that have influenced community structure. They have uh, had an influ uh, have resulted, their adjustment has resulted in less farms, and less people, which means that we need less schools and the like. Another area which I think they are having difficulty to make adjustments, and that is in the past there's sort of been tension between the farmer and the people in the small town or on Main Street. Now, I think what we need here is a new image of town and country. By town and country, I mean not just the open country in the village, but we need to see this, uh, the farmer and the man on Main Street as being a part of the same web of human activity. And they need to begin to think together and how they can think in terms of building a more adequate life or a more meaningful life 
for the people in our rural sector. Now, Arno, you come from a small community, and I understand you have been working in this area. Uh, what is some of your experiences that you have in getting town people and uh, farm people working together? Well, thank you, Dr. Mueller. Uh, I'd like to endorse the previous statement that our biggest problem today is the problem of education. Uh, making people realize that this problem actually exists. Uh, I think it stems from the fact that too few of the people living in rural America have any understanding whatsoever of the theory or the uh, status of economics. They don't realize where their wealth is created. They don't have a proper understanding of where their money comes from and how it's spent and the effect that the various segments of our economy has on one another. The, the small town businessmen, the farmer, the banker, uh, the church, the entire community, we're all riding in this same boat together. And the biggest problem that we have in rural America today is the problem of education. Making people, uh, bringing people to an awareness that this problem does exist and that it's affecting each and every one of us. And unless we can know and understand that this problem does exist, we can't attack it from, from uh, any position. And so we must make the people in rural America aware that our way of life is being threatened. Now, whether or not there's anything we can do about uh, this to preserve it is another thing. After listening to the uh, orthodox uh, economists today and the statisticians and so forth, I've come to the conclusion that the problem is even more serious than we have been painting it. And uh, unless the people in rural America are willing to make a study to get together and uh, uh, learn more about this problem that's going to affect their way of life, uh, then I think it's hopeless to, uh, to try to solve the thing. And uh, therefore, education is essential today. Now, who really has this responsibility to create this awareness? Let's take granted that there is no awareness on the part of the people as to what the real problems are. Now, we have many uh, organizations, many good organizations that are very active in the rural field, and uh, they represent, represent various points of view. But uh, I would make the observation that often these groups are uh, uh, meeting separately with themselves. For instance, here we may list to mention a few. Here is the uh, very good organization, the REA, which I think is a very powerful organization. And then another organization we have in rural America doing an effective job in the area of soil conservation, soil conservation districts. Then we have farm organizations. And yet, uh, and then we have the Chamber of Commerce as a small town. Do these groups uh, talk past each other, or do they complement each other, or do they sometimes undo the things that they are doing? In other words, what we need to do, I think, is plow around the field in the same direction. I observe that sometimes this is not the case. I see this particularly, probably, with uh, cooperatives, farm groups, and the like. And I would, as a churchman, I would like to call for a more a sense of reconciliation of these various groups beginning to see this as having a, a mutual problem. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to uh, be, uh, just have one organization. But I do think it's important that they share views. But again, I uh, raise the question as who really takes the lead and how do we get this thing done? I'd but like to inject just one thought on that subject. Uh, we have a diversion of thinking amongst the farm groups, and this is where the problem actually exists. And in my viewpoint, uh, from the standpoint of a rural businessman, uh, it is a responsibility of the businessmen and the civic leaders in that community to make sure that the economic standards of that community are growing rather than dying. But due to the fact that the farmers themselves and their own organizations can't agree, the businessmen of rural communities are actually afraid to take a stand in fear of losing a customer. And this is one of the problem of businessmen. And unless these businessmen will uh, take the courage and offer the leadership of getting farmers and businessmen and church leaders and school superintendents together so that we can discuss this problem as a group and uh, reach some type of conclusion, uh, there isn't much hope. Well, let's take a very concrete situation here, from the standpoint of agreeing and businessmen not taking a stand. Now, that we, we have mentioned the economic problem, that farmers are not receiving an adequate income for that which they produce and that which they, they sell. Now, there is a, prob uh, there is a, 
uh, a program being proposed by a group to, uh, through uh, more adequate bargaining and through marketing to give the farmer a more adequate income. But at this point, you get a real clash of interest. We have observed that this of a difference of opinion at, uh, on this approach sometimes divides communities and sometimes divides even some of our church groups or our, and a congregation. Now, I would say, here's where I think we as people living in rural areas need to grow up and become mature. I would say there is always more than one approach. There's more than one viewpoint, and that there are different points of view. This is not bad, but I think it's bad when we permit a different point of view or a different approach uh, if another person has a different approach than mine, that therefore I get angry at him as a person. And I think here, I think the business people could uh, maybe help to, uh, to clarify this or discuss this, but uh, this brings us into, I think, some of the uh, uh, lack of the proper attitudes that we have in rural areas. And who, and again, it calls educational program, but the question is, again, who takes the initiative? Well, I think you're talking here, uh, Dr. Mueller, about an adult educational program. And uh, I think in the rural communities, I know it's true in mine, uh, thinking in the community becomes pretty rigidified, pretty stratified. Everybody's had about the same opinion for a number of years. They're not about to change it. And I don't know but what in this, uh, in this area we might uh, practice a little... Uh, uh, some of the ecumenical spirit. And perhaps it is an area in which the clergy uh, can, between themselves and the various denominations, uh, draw out uh, the different individuals and let them examine each other's point of view for a change. Uh, now, I know that many communities are close to universities, and uh, they have the benefit of the college professors who uh, have thought these things through pretty carefully. Uh, we don't in our particular area, and uh, perhaps this is a place where the clergy could enter in uh, to kind of uh, moderate uh, uh, an open discussion on this problem and perhaps uh, we can learn from one another some of the things that we're trying to ignore now to preserve uh, our way of life, uh, life in rural America, which is really going to cost us our way of life if we continue to ignore it. How about that, George? Uh, I think uh, I would second your last statement. <coughs> and uh, I don't know, but we might have a vote of approval from this gr uh, group on the panel at uh, mm -hmm. the point that uh, we may sacrifice our rural way of life uh, when we try to defend it in terms of the status quo. And I think you've hit upon another important point that goes back to something that Arnold was speaking about before, and that is, w and you also, E.W., were talking about the who is going to lead this. I am not the most optimistic individual in the world about the leadership in rural area taking up this problem and working with it in an enthusiastic fashion. For this reason, if some changes are involved, the very people who have positions of leadership now may have to think of forms of social organization and patterns of activity which would make them somewhat less important than they are presently, and they feel threatened by the fact that these changes may threaten their position. If I were a superintendent of a school, or a president of a bank, or a minister in a congregation, and I felt that an effective organization of the rural community meant that I had to merge my operation with another school system in another community so that the greatest uh, benefit could be obtained by the people of the rural community. And as a result, I'd be an assistant superintendent. I might think twice, because I perhaps would rather be a superintendent in a small school than an assistant superintendent in a large school, or a president in a small bank rather than a vice president in a large bank. In other words, I think there's a lot of ego, invested interest involved in this problem on the part of leadership. And I think that leaders look to their position of leadership in terms of the vested interest rather than in terms of the public trust that is vested in them as business leaders, religious leaders, educational leaders, or whatever type of leadership they have. So while I say I'm not optimistic, I'm not pessimistic either. I think that the leadership will have to rise to the occasion it's not going to happen on the part of followers. The leadership is going to have to become aware, and they're going to have to undertake action programs directed towards resolving the problem. Could I ask uh, uh, Professor Donahue one question? This afternoon, you uh, made a statement about too many of the rural communities are living in false hope, thinking they're going to solve their problems by attracting industry. Uh, I think you made a very good statement this afternoon, if you can recall it. 
That's right, if I can recall. <laughs> uh, what I indicated, I think, was that not every rural community that is in existence today is going to be able to attract industry. Certain communities with particular locational features, and particularly those above 2,000 in size, uh, depending upon the size of the communities in the area, it might be a community of 1,000 in size for that matter, depending on whether or not there are larger or smaller communities around it. If it's the largest single community and it's only 1,000, then it probably will be the one that will grow. But I think that uh, the f distance between communities today, their location to markets, are not such that they will necessarily result in uh, high degrees of industrialization or high uh, amount of acceptance of them as locational sites for industry. It, the location of industry is such that it will go to where other subcontractors are located or skills are already located in the area. Therefore, I say the traditional rural trade center was dedicated to small family type subsistence farming. We not only have to change the type of farming, but we have to change the social institutions and the communities that go along with it. Now, this is not the most uh, optimistic for people who have identified with the community, and it's not going to occur overnight. This is an issue that we have to discuss because I would say too often that we tend to think that only the town that has the industry is one that benefits. Now, I would say that many of our small towns ought to work together with neighboring cities that are larger in the interest of getting industry to the area because uh, this might benefit uh, the town or will benefit the city where the industry is located but it can also benefit the satellite town if they are within driving distance and we tend to uh, let distance be a barrier but i think instead of talking about a third a uh, uh, a distance community we ought to think in terms of a time community for instance just think in terms of a of a 30-minute community this takes in a lot of territory, you see. And just recently, I was in a situation in Iowa where a small town was located about halfway in between two larger towns, very aggressive towns. And it was 20 miles each way. And, uh, and the question was now, should this little town work for industry? See? But they made a very wise decision. They thought they would explore the possibility of just being a bedroom town see, for the two towns that were uh, cities that were to to both sides of them. Both had packing plants, and already many were working there, you see. So I think the point I'm trying to get at is that there are things that people can do together, you see. And instead of fighting each other, if they will begin to see the larger picture and see the bigger picture, then I think many positive things come, uh, can come out of this. And there are many good things going for rural America. And I think we probably ought to uh, emphasize so some of these and, uh, and not take too pessimistic an attitude. This does not mean that we will not have to make adjustments and that we will have to change uh, some of the structure that we had in the past. But it does mean that uh, if there is some vision and if people get together and begin to establish some goals, that there may be some uh, real possibility of realizing them. Now, I, you've made a statement there that I, I don't like to pin you down, but you said anything goes on this program. Right. So I'd like to uh, ask you a question. You said rural America has many good things going for it. Would you mind naming five? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, they, I mean, you can probably get me going on five, but I would say, number one, they have space. There's one thing that we don't have in Chicago, and that is space, crowded conditions. Another thing that you have going for you in rural America is fresh air. In this matter of uh, environmental uh, situation that we have in Chicago is becoming a real concern. The air is being polluted. We have, uh, have a water problem sometimes. And the, uh, now I would say we have other things going for us in rural America that they have the possibility of people knowing each other on a first, uh, I mean, uh, on a first name basis. Uh, the more or less the informal community. Now there's many negative things in rural America. I've just mentioned three. But I would say there was other things could be going for rural America if we would work at it. Basically, I don't think we have really looked at working at creating what I would call a quality community. And now this will mean uh, investing some of our efforts and some of our thinking and some of our, our, our uh, think power in here. And I am, I am encouraged by what is happening as a result of rural areas development or resource development. Of course, it comes back to whether our community can afford it. And this brings us back to the problem where we more or less started is uh, can we improve the economic flow of money into rural areas? And if we could do this, I think we'd have still more things going for us.
Well, I think, uh, Dr. Mueller, that we might say we've got everything going for us in rural America except the one thing, and that is the economic standard of living. And that many of the things that we, we know we have, and surely the people in rural America know better than anybody else what we have to lose. And if we ourselves are, are not uh, willing to uh, support the, the thinking, the planning uh, that has to go into to, uh, maintaining our uh, local economy and our, the rural America that we love so much, uh, then certainly nobody else is going to do it for us. I think this is a very uh, crucial thing that you mentioned, Vince. And I observe this, you see, we have an interest off our self-interest conflicts with group interest. And the thing which hurts us, I think, in rural areas is this, that sometimes when rural people are not willing, what I call make a commitment to their group, see, and as soon as their self-interest conflicts with group interest, they will sell out their group. This is one reason why I think it has been difficult for farm organizations to really affect an effective farm organization. Because as soon as self-interest conflicts with the interest of the group, or long-term self-interest, they tend to vote for self-interest. Now, I think at this point, we need to do a lot of educating, particularly from the standpoint of social responsibility and uh, not just individual responsibility. Well, we're getting close to the end of the program, and I think uh, any of you have something on your heart that you want to really get off before we sign off? I do. Okay. I, I'll choose to be the devil's advocate here for this reason. Both you and Vince said rural America has an awful lot going for it. You listed three for me, E.W., and I would say if it has a lot going for it, I'd like to see the rural leadership be able to list ten. Boom, 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 like that. The other thing is, I think they should not only list the ten things going for it, but the ten things that are disadvantages of the area, because here's where the problem will rest in terms of the disadvantages as well as the assets of the area. And these are the things will, which will have to be corrected if effective social action and development is to occur in the rural community of today. Well, next time we meet, we'll have 10 on both counts. Okay. So this brings to the cl close, and I would appreciate your being on this program and sharing your views with us. This program has been brought to you by the members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area, in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. For more information or suggestions on how to solve our farm problem, contact this station.